Magna Carta to the rescue. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to give you a short history lesson as to how Magna Carta has been implemented. Uh, it's been implemented three times in the last 800 years or so. Uh, and at the end of it, you'll, you'll understand how it's implemented and what a constitutional convention is. What a constitutional convention is, because that's the object of the exercise. It appears en en energy is going to be sorted out. This is, the, this is sorting out law and order. It's a quote from Winston Churchill. Now, at the end of his life, Winston Churchill had a bit of a deathbed um, uh, confession that he did, did some things early in life he shouldn't have done, but uh, the facts embodied in it, Magna Carta, and the circumstances giving rise to them were buried or misunderstood. The underlying idea of sovereignty of the law, long existing in feudal custom, was raised by it into a doctrine for the national state. And when in subsequent ages the state, swollen with its own authority, has attempted to ride roughshod over the rights and liberties of the subject, it is this doctrine that that appeal has been made, again and again been made, and never as yet without success. So that's our job, to appeal to Magna Carta successfully. A bit of inspiration here. I'm a bit of a fan of Rudyard Kipling. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, what say the reeds at Runnymede? The listen reeds that give and take, that bend so far and never break. They keep the sleepy Thames awake with tales of John at Runnymede. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, oh, hear the reeds at Runnymede. You mustn't sell, delay, deny a freeman's right or liberty. It makes the stubborn Englishry. We saw them roused at Runnymede. When through our ranks the barons came, with little thought or praise or blame, but resolute to pay a game, they lumbered down up to Runnymede. And there they launched in solid time the first attack on right divine, the curt, uncompromising sign that settled John at Runnymede. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, your rights were won at Runnymede. No freeman shall be fined or bound or dispossessed or freehold ground, except by lawful judgment and found and passed upon him by his peers. Forget not after all these years the charter signed at Runnymede. And still when mob or monarch lays too rude a hand on English ways, the whisper wakes, the shudder plays across the reeds at Runnymede, and Thames that knows the moods of kings and crowds and priests and such like things rolls deep and dreadful as he brings their warning down from Runnymede. The English tree is the English speaking people throughout the world. It's not just us. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the Commonwealth. Uh, and we should be an inspiration to the rest of the world, I would argue. That's the big picture. Let's see what Magna Carta Chapter 61 said. It's originally in Latin, so, so you have to bear in mind it's been tr translated. And, of course, the other side will tinker with the translation, given half a chance. This is the... This is the, the approved, shall we say, translation uh, from the co two copies of Magna Carta which are in the, the British Library. Chapter 61 is the right to rebel. Since we've granted all these things for God, for the better ordering of our kingdom, and to lay the discourse that's arisen between us and our barons, and since we desire that they shall enjoy in their entirety with lasting strength forever, we give and grant to the barons the following security. Okay? And free men as well, not just barons. The barons select 25 of their number to keep and cause to be observed with all their might the peace and liberties granted and conferred to them by this charter. Now, the, the barons' committee is formed when people petition. When, when the barons have to be told about grievances uh, that the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, irking the people. In actual fact, this was done in 1999. If we, our Chief Justice, our officials, or any of our servants offend in any respect against any man or transgress any of the articles of the peace or of this security, and the offence is made known to the four, four of the said 25 barons, they should come to us, or in our absence, the King of the Chief Justice, declare it and, re reclaim it and claim immediate redress. If we, or in our absence abroad, the Chief Justice make no redress within 40 days, reckoning from the day on which the offence was declared to us or to him, the four barons shall refer the matter to the rest of the 25 barons, who may distrain and assail us in every possible way with the support of the whole community of the land. Distrain means seize the profit of land, so hold income tax. Uh, whole council tax, that, that sort of thing, and seize, seize buildings. Well, we did it in, in Birkenhead, didn't we, in March last year, for those that were there. By seizing our castles, lands, possessions, or anything else, saving only our person, those of the Queen and our children, until they have secured redress as they have determined upon. Having secured the redress, they may then resume their normal obedience. So the, the bit about as they have determined upon, that, that's the authority for a, for a constitutional convention. That what, that's what was done. I said there, was, there were been three in the last 800 years. The first was at Runnymede. Uh, uh, it's, it's a meadow, for those that have been there. It's a, it's a meadow, a piece of flat land near Windsor Castle. And the barons got together and they had the first constitutional convention. The barons were the, the final court of appeal, in actual fact, and as, as they still are. Uh, so what, that, what they determined had the status of a legal judgment. So the barons get together around Windsor Castle. They say that King John's been out of order. The population had risen up and supported them. Uh, uh, when, the, when the poem refers to 
the barons came through our ranks. That's, that's, that's a free man, imagine, that's imagining a free man who, who's not actually a baron, but has supported the barons, and the barons, barons are the ones that ha, ha, had the, uh, the Constitutional Convention and made the, uh, made the decision. As to what happened in 1688, we'll talk, come to that shortly. Any man who so desires to take an oath to obey the commands of the 25 barons for the achievement of the ends and to join them in assailing us to the utmost of his power, we give public and free permission to take this oath. Who's taken that oath? Anybody, anybody written to the Queen? Yeah, Lance at the back. Yes, OK, well, that's, that's, that's on your to-do list. Uh, we're going to put this on the website with some instructions about how to do it. We give public and free permission to take this oath, and any man who so desires, and in no time we prohibit any man from taking it. Now, here's the important bit, the last sentence. Indeed, we will compel any of our subjects who are unwilling to take it to swear it at our command. So, you're, so those that haven't, haven't done it yet, you've got an instruction there, haven't you? There's a common law obligation. And in fact, in fact committing offence of public nuisance. <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, OK. Pu public nuisance is, 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 a, is a failure to comply with a statutory or common law obligation. So you're a lot of, you're a lot of nuisances until you sort that out. OK. <laughs> diffidatio. Now, what, what the barons did, they, 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 they declared diffidatio, which was re rebellion or resistance. Uh, uh, Blackstone is the, uh, it was Lord Chief Justice, who wrote, wrote a series of, uh, of books in the, uh, the mid-1700s which are authoritative. Uh, the well-known one is Blackstone's commentaries, but he also wrote a, wrote a book on Magna Carta. So this is what happens. Uh, bear in mind, Magna Carta's in June 1215. So on 5th of May 1215, the barons, having chosen their leader, Robert Fitzwater, acclaimed by them as master of the army of God and Holy Church, performed the solemn funeral ceremony of diffidatio, resistance, uh, 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 or renunciation of their fealty and homage, a formality indispensable before vassals could, without an infamy, wage war upon their feudal overlord. Now, I thought that you had a duty of allegiance for life, but apparently not. You can withdraw with it when the, the Lord that you've sworn allegiance to breaches their contract. Who would say Her Majesty, or Queen Elizabeth or Elizabeth Saxe-Gotha has breached a contract? There we go. Absolved from their allegiance and wallowing from my can of Durham, they marched on London. It's a tactical option, isn't it? As, 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 as Roger said, it's a tactical option. Hopefully, you won't have to go down that route. This is what happened in the Constitution Convention. This is the barons get together and they decide what, what the score is. It was on 15th of June then, in the year 1215, that the conference began between John, supported by a slender following of half-hearted magnates upon one side, and the mail-clad barons, backed by a multitude of determined and well-armed knights, upon the other. The conference lasted for eight days, from Monday of one week till Tuesday of the next. On Monday the 15th, John set seal to the demands presented to him by the barons, accepting every one of their articles with the additional former securitas or executive clause vesting in 25 of their number full authority to constrain John, King John by force or reserve its provisions. Now, some people say that uh, <coughs> Magna Carta is void because it was obtained by force. Not so. Title of the land is settled by trial by combat. Title of the land is settled by trial by combat. And remember, the barons had risen up uh, and they'd been supported by the jobs of the population. They'd captured London. And they were entitled to appoint who, whoever they wanted as the next king. But as a concession, they allowed John to continue. Okay? So, so the title of the land is settled by trial by combat, and that still applies to the present day. If a new king takes over by trial by combat, the classic example is William, William the Conqueror. If William the Conqueror takes over, all he takes over is the, is, the, is the job of king. He has no authority to change the legal system. No authority to change the legal system. And that's the fundamental reason why the EU is, 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 is not on, because... They haven't taken over my combat by, by stealth, but nobody can change our legal system. And that's what they're trying to do. They're try, trying to impose corpus juris on, aren't they, the continental legal system. Now, here's an authority for a constitutional conviction. There's, there's several of them. Authority means a justification. Well, I'm quoting Chapter 61 of Magna Carta again. Having secured the redress, they may then resume their normal beats to us. So once the Barons Committee as a... As, as a uh, obtain redress, then, then, then we can return to normal. So Magna Carta is an authority for having a constitutional convention. Now the second one is the Coronation Oath Act 16, 1688. The former service that the Queen took uh, is set by the Coronation Oath Act 1688, and, th and this, is, this is what it says. The Archbishop or Bishop shall say, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the people of this Kingdom of England and the dominions thereto, remember the English tree, not just this country, belonging according to the statutes and palms agreed on and the laws and customs are the same. And the king and queen shall say, I solemnly promise so to do. 
and she hasn't. That's the problem. Blackstone on the rights of Englishmen. Now, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to explain what happened in, in, in 1999. Uh, this, this is Blackstone's commentaries. And lastly, to vindicate these rights, and that's the rights of Englishmen, <coughs> when viola actually violated attack, the subjects of England are entitled in the first place to the regular administration and free course of justice in the courts of law, next to the right of petitioning the kingdom part for redress of grievance, and lastly to the right of having and using arms for self-preservation. Now, we've got to level two, because we're not getting justice in the courts, are we? Okay. Um, uh, in 1999, Parliament was petitioned, uh, and that means every member of the House of Commons and every member of the House of Lords had, had, uh, had, a, had a, uh, a petition about upholding the Common Law, Magna Carta and Bill of Rights, uh, the text of which is in the document I'm going to show you shortly. We haven't got to the um, using arms for defence stage yet. Now, there's, there's somebody exercising his right to bear arms. That's a man called Magna Carta. He was an, he was an old soldier. Um, he, he, he flirted with UKIP and the Conservative Party because and, and he, he knew something was wrong in the country. But what he was concerned about was not politics but law. Because as a soldier, he'd been taught the law of the land. Because soldiers are taught the law of the land to some degree so, so that they know where they stand in the event there's a civil war. So Magna Carta, a society founded by Bob Lomas in 1999 to restore the British Constitution as a matter of law, not politics. Uh, they produced a research paper. I was a humble researcher on that. Um, which was endorsed by a QC, Leonin Price, eminent QC. There's only a limited number of QCs that specialise in constitutional law because that sort of case doesn't come up very often. And the Society petitioned all members of the Laws of Commons to uphold the Declaration of Rights, 1688, and, and refused further integration with the EU. At that stage, the Nice Treaty was coming up. Here's the, here's the, uh, here's the front page of the petition. A petition to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, presented under Clause 61 of Magna Carta 1215, defend, defend British rights and freedoms. Um, here's a copy of it. It's going to be a bit small, I understand that. There it is, get it the right way up. Roger's going to reproduce these, uh, and this is something we, I think we should all have a, a, a take notice of. So it's actually been done. It's not theoretical, it's been done. So you want to know what happened, don't you? Here's what's in the petition. This is the key part. Where if it's a humble duty, four barons went and, see, went and saw, saw the Queen. The reason barons, uh, barons have, 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 have two common law rights, one is to uh, personally petition the Queen, go and see him or her, um, and the second, second is, to, is to be consulted about, about her, her measures, anything she decides to do. They're entitled to be consulted. Uh, now, the problem now is that it, since 1999 in the House of Lords Act, the vast majority of hereditary peers have had their common law rights infringed, haven't they? Yeah, so, so, so that, that, that I'll come to that in a, in a moment. So 1999, <coughs> uh, the, the House of Lords Act caused a problem, and in 2001, the, baron, the barons who were aggrieved by it get together and they get, go and deliver this petition. And what they tell the Queen, it's not a request, they tell the Queen, to withhold royal assent from any parliamentary bill which attempts to ratify the Treaty of Nice unless until the people of the United Kingdom have given a clear and specific approval. Now, it's not a referendum, actually, because referendums are unknown to our constitution. What we do, we elect our representatives to represent our interests in Parliament. Uh, those are the Commons, and the Lords represent the interests of property, and they debate what to do. Const uh, referendums are unknown to the constitution, and in particular, a referendum on the EU will be unlawful because you'd be asking for people to commit treason. Okay, so it's not a referendum. It's a constitutional convention at the end of the day. And the second one is to hold and preserve the rights, freedoms, and customs of your law subjects as set out in Magna Carta and the Declaration of Rights, which you, our sovereign, swore before the nation to uphold and preserve in your coronation oath. So, so uh, the Declaration of Rights is what the Bill of Rights was based on, because the Declaration of Rights is a constitution convention in 1688. In that case, it was the ingredients of a parliament. Um, King James II had done a bunk to France, um, uh, and the, the throne was vacant, so they couldn't have a parliament, because parliament is Lords, Commons and King, so there's no king. Uh, so, so the, the ingredients of a parliament was summoned together, together with representatives of, uh, the, uh, the, from up and down the country, uh, burgesses and wardens of the tank ports and people like that, and magistrates. They get together in Westminster and they have a meeting and they, 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 they write out the Declaration of Rights um, and, and, <coughs> and there are 13 heads of grievance that were addressed and that's why there are, th there are 13 rights in the Bill of Rights. Article 5, for example, is the limitation on the standing army in peacetime. Article 7 is the right to bear arms. Now, it's come out a bit small, hasn't it? Okay. There are, there are, there are about 30 of... Uh, there are, there's the second page. It's a bit bigger. 
Now, because this is, this is 2001, unfortunately, uh, quite a lot of them have passed on. Uh, it doesn't matter. An ancestors in, in, in 1215 had foresight. And basically, surviving members of the committee can appoint others. Uh, and the steps are in hand. Start, they started when Malcolm Massey was arrested at Birkenhead last year. Um, it's gone on from there. Uh, uh, and, 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 and steps are being taken to encourage those who survived to react, reactivate the committee and, uh, and, and recruit new members. We've got about 100 new members, apparently. It was in the press, you probably missed it. Daily Telegraph article. A group of peers today, will today use ancient rights granted under Magna Carta to urge the Queen to block further European integration. Their petition, presented under Clause 61 of the Ancient Charter, asked the Queen to withhold royal assent from the Nice Treaty. It's the backing of 65 Eurosceptic peers led by Lord Ashbourne and has been organised by Sanity. That's, that, that's, that's a, a group that arose out of the Magna Carta Society. Clause 61 of Magna Carta, signed by King John at Runnymede in June 1215, permits the sovereign subject to present a quorum of 25 barrels with a petition which four of their number are then obliged to take to the monarch. The reason it's four is, in, that, in, um, in, in the olden days, going to see the king to t tell him he was out of order was a bit risky. So, so they were drawn by lot, the four. <laughs> there we go. She, uh, 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 four of their number are then obliged to take to the monarch, who's obliged to accept it. She then has 40 days to respond. The enforcement powers granted by King John, now that's not quite right, because this is written by the journalists, they weren't granted by the King John, they're part of the common law, the diffidatio concept, the right to rebel. Granted by King John when he signed the Magna Carta were last used in 1688 at the start of the Glorious Revolution I've just referred to. Lord Ashbourne, a conservative Frederick peer, ousted from the laws under Tony Blair's reform said, these rights may not have been exercised for 300 years, but only, only because they were not needed. Well, we need them now. They may be a little dusty, but they're in good order. And the concept of dusty laws is, uh, needs covering. In Scotland, if, if laws aren't used, they become obsolete. It's known as desuetude. That's unknown to the English common law. In fact, the older a law is, the stronger it is, because it means the more generations of our ancestors supported it, the more generations of ancestors. Now, 800 years, how many generations is that? Quite a lot, isn't it? 20? 21? Something, something like that. All our ancestors support it, so the older it is, the stronger it is. Now, Sir Robert Janvering, who is the Queen's private secretary, here's what, here's, here's what he replied. I am commanded by the Queen to reply to your letter of 23rd of March and the accompanying petition to Her Majesty about the Treaty of Nice. The Queen continues to give the issue her closest attention. She is well aware of the strength of feeling which European treaties, such as the Treaty of Nice, cause. And as a constitutional sovereign, Her Majesty is advised by a government who support this treaty. As I'm sure you know, the Treaty of Nice cannot enter into force until it's been ratified by all member states and in the United Kingdom. This entails the necessary legislation being passed in Parliament. What happened next? Lawful rebellion. Still in force. The Queen is mouthing the, the, the party line uh, that uh, I have to do what my ministers tell me. And of course she's wrong. So that's the basis of it. So n n now you know it happened for real in 2001 after, after petitioning. Uh, it wasn't just a self-appointed group, the Magna Carta Society. Sanity had about 350,000 postcards sent in to the Queen. So there was a, you know, there was a, it, it wasn't just a private thing. Um, and the, the decision the barons made in, t in, in, t in 2001 has, has the status of, 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 of a legal judgment. It's unreported. Well, it's, strictly speaking, it's not reported because if legal cases are reported in the Telegraph or the Times, they're, they're considered to be uh, reported. So, 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 so that's the petition. Any questions about uh, the petition that was, that was uh, served in, in uh, 2001? No? Okay. Right. Now we go on to the next, uh, next bit about private prosecutions. Speak up. <coughs> I do have a question about something you said about the um, trial by combat. Trial by combat, yes, yeah. Oh, there, there we go. Hello? <laughs> well, okay, yeah, um, something you said about trial by combat. Yeah. So if I made a land claim. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, You're prepared to fight them for it. Sorry? You were prepared to fight them for it. Well, could I, could I invoke well, trial yeah, by combat? I, I don't see why not. Tri tri um, uh, trial started as tri trial by ordeal. Ordeal by water being drowned or ordeal by hot stone or hot iron. Um, and then it went on to trial by combat and, 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 and people would elect their champions. Uh, in its final form, the weapons were cudgels. 
uh, and people could wear protective clothing except for their forearms, and they used to beat each other with cudgels until one fell out, and that, that was sufficient. Uh, okay. I wish uh, I'd known about uh, that. Uh, uh, that's right. Um, and and, 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 and uh, 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 jury trial then became more popular. So jury trial went in. Uh, the, la the last time trial by combat was tried was 1820. There's, there's an English chap had, a, had an issue, he wanted it. Uh, and the court said no, and Parliament shortly after was pressed a, pressed a, uh, passed a, uh, an act of Parliament uh, suppressing it. Um, as you probably know, um, who can quote the American Second, Second Amendment? The right to bear arms shall not be infringed. The reason it says infringed is uh, when a common law is broken, it doesn't go away, it just gets infringed. Okay, so the, even though there may, act, may be an act of parliament that contradicts it, it doesn't mean it goes away. And it can't go away because the Queen promised to rule according to laws, customs and statutes agreed on. So um, she can't give royal assent lawfully to a statute which breaches a, a law or custom, can she? Biological impossibility. Now, she has on the advice of the ministers, but that's one of the things we hold against her. Does that answer the question? Yeah, sure. There I we just, go. just think that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice idea. Yes, you're a healthy chap. You, 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 yeah, I can, I can take those <laughs> weedy guys from the council. I'm getting past it. Right. I don't know what I've done now. Let's, let's, let's open this one. It's always difficult with somebody else's computer, isn't it? Right. Well, I was introduced at the beginning. I've been a prosecutor for 30 years, a private prosecutor for 30 years. Private prosecutor for 30 years. And I didn't know it, to my shame. There we are. I'll explain why shortly. What I'm going to do, I'm not a lawyer, but I can read and remember, and what I'm going to do is present you some of the legal arguments that have been made in favour of private prosecution. So once you've seen these legal arguments, um, you'll understand that it is part of our law and it's something that we can use. Um, in the same way as the gentleman talking about energy is giving you an alternative to the electricity bill, uh, this is, this is it's cut, cut, cut the nonsense, I nearly said cut the crap, cut the crap, cut the nonsense. What's been happening, in the, what's the real problem with the Jimmy Savile revelations? What's the real problem? Sorry? Yeah, there is that. Now, people have been reporting things to the police and the CPS and the authorities, and what's happened? Nothing. nothing. Okay, so that's, that's what this is about. Okay, so, so a judgment, you quote the name of it. Historically, all, um, this is the, and, and when you look at the judgment, you look at the legal argument. So I'm going to give you the legal argument in favour of private prosecutions. So, so if you agree with me, then you can, you can, you can assist in, uh, in using them. Um, Mike Doherty there. Has taught, taught me more or less all I know about this because policemen, policemen don't know about it because they keep it quiet. <laughs> okay. uh, so Mike Doherty started, started the ball rolling. He's got, some, he's got practical experience. But in actual fact, I, I've been doing private prosecution as well, just I didn't know it. There we go. Right. Historically, this is, this is, this is the judgment. This is a judge speaking, not, not me. Historically, all prosecutions in England were private prosecutions. The vast majority now are instituted by public author authorities notably the Crown Prosecution Service. However, the right to institute private prosecution is retained in the Prosecution Offences Act. There we go. That's good. Isn't it? We've got an Act of Parliament. In fact, it's a common law right, isn't it? And um, when, you, when, you, when you want to prosecute somebody, what you're doing is you're petitioning for aggressive grievance. So let's imagine there's a policeman walking down the road uh, and somebody comes up to him and says, somebody has hit me on the nose. I want you to do something about it. That's a petition for aggressive grievance, isn't it? Or more seriously, I've been raped by some horrible, undesirable... What are you going to do about it? That's a petition for redress of grievance, isn't it? Um, and we've talked about the Bill of Rights. One of the, one of the uh, articles in the Bill of Rights is it's the rights of the subjects to petition the Crown for redress of grievance. And then it goes on to say all petitions and prosecutions for doing the same are illegal and void. And what's what's, what that's referring to, going back in, into history, in the run-up to the Bill of Rights in 1687, uh, uh, James II uh, wanted to turn the country Catholic. So he wrote a proclamation and he gave it to all the bishops and he said, De you know, disseminate to this to your churches and read it out next Sunday. And the bishops read this, and they said, no, we can't possibly do that. We're, we're, we're Protestant. We've agreed to be Protestant. So they went to the king. They chose six of their number. You remember this concept? It's a bit dangerous going to see the king. <laughs> they chose six of the number on this occasion. Um, and and uh, said, to, said, to, said to James II, we can't possibly uh, comply with this new reversion to Catholicism. And he locked them up in the tower. Locked them up in the tower. But apparently the, the soldiers who, who took him away... Um, showed every sign of respect to the bishops. There were, there were silent crowds in the streets as they were led to the River Thames, and they were rowed down, down to, down to uh, tower, uh, the Tower of London, went in through Tracy's Gate. Uh, <coughs> the soldiers, in, soldiers in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the Tower of London did a similar thing, bowed to the bishops as they passed, and they didn't stay there long. James II uh, took it as a hint, in actual fact, that his policies weren't going to go down well. So there we are. Historically, all prosecutions were private prosecutions. 
in my judgment, there's no requirement for a person seeking to have a summons issued to approach the police first. Particularly if you know there's a problem. Particularly if you know there's a problem, which, is, which we do now. Hillsborough was an outrage, wasn't it? Changing statements. Here are three authorities. Remember I said authorities. Well, authority is a book like Blackstone. Authority is uh, an act of parliament or rules. We'll talk about the difference between an act of parliament and rule shortly. Magistrates' Courts Act 1980, Section 1. Prosecution Offences Act 1985, Section 6, 1. And the Criminal Procedure Rules, Part 7. Here's the Magistrates' Court. On the information being laid, and information is evidence. You go and tell a magistrate, give him information, somebody's done something bad, and you're prepared to swear to it. On an information being laid before a Justice of the Peace, the person has or is suspected to have commission defence, the justice may issue. Now, may, depending on the context in a legal uh, le an enactment, means must. It's not voluntary. Okay? Because if you've got a well-founded case and you go and tell the magistrate about it and he doesn't take it on board, what's he doing? Yeah? He's blocking your right to have redress of grievance, isn't he? Okay? Now, because the right to have redress of grievance is a constitutional right, what offence is committed by a person who breaches a constitutional right? begins with a T. Treason. Yeah, treason. Uh, and what, what offence is committed by anybody else, about, anybody else who knows about it and doesn't do anything about it? Misprision of treason. Yes, misprision is the common law concept of knowing about a, a treason and not doing something about it. Misprision used to apply to all crimes, all felonies, up until 1967. But it's been, been put on a statutory basis uh, since then, as far as, far as ordinary crimes are concerned. Uh, it's either conceding an offence or conceding an offender. That Miss Bridgian is specifically for treason, retained for treason. And what you're asking the magistrate to do is get the person in front of the court, summons or warrant. Prosecution of Offences Act 1986. Subject to subsection 2, nothing in this part should preclude any person from instituting any criminal proceedings or conducting any criminal proceedings to which the director's duty to take over the conduct of proceedings does not apply. Okay? Where criminal proceedings are instituted in circumstances in which the director is not under a duty to take over the conduct, he may nevertheless do so. Now, we're going to come to, come to a, come on, discuss a case called Gurdjieff, which was, which was released by the Supreme Court as recently as 14th of November. Um, uh, um, Mike is a bit of an expert on that on, on, on as well, because he, he had a part in it, uh, and I've researched it, and I'll talk about that shortly. Here's Gurdjieff. The director of public prosecutions has power to take over a private prosecution, and therefore uh, thereupon to discontinue it. So you're all thinking, oh no, aren't you? Of course they'll take them over and un undo them. Well, it's not as simple as that. In determining whether to do so, it is policy to apply certain criteria. Prior to 2009, the director asked himself whether the evidence clearly failed, failed to disclose a case sufficient for the defendant to be called upon to answer it. If his conclusion was, clearly, that was that it clearly failed to do so, he took over the prosecution and discontinued it. But in 2009, he changed his policy in relation to the evidential criterion. And that was when the pressure was on. You see, people like Mike have been uh, pushing the envelope, haven't they? And that's how this case came about. But in 2009, he changed his policy in relation to the evidential criterion. It became his policy to take over a private prosecution and discontinue it unless the evidence was such as to render the prosecution more likely to result in a conviction or not. Whenever you hear policy, your bullshit alarm should go off. Because it's not law, is it? Yeah? Policy. And they push the envelope. In an adversarial legal system, to some degree, it's good that they push the envelope because then it can be tested. But it in an adversarial legal system, you need somebody to stand up, don't you? Somebody to realise what's going on and do something about it. Now, here's, here's some of the discussion, because there were five judges dealt with this case, and I'm, I'm quote, quoting some of them. Until the late 19th century, prosecutions were brought almost entirely by the victims of alleged crimes, or if they were dead, by their kinsmen, local parish constables, not organised on any national or even regional basis, and not even paid, sometimes helped the victims to prosecute. By about 1730, if they could afford it, prosecutors and defendants sometimes engaged lawyers to rep represent them. At around the same time, associations of people with a common sexual interest in prosecuting particular offenses sprang up in order to conduct prosecutions on behalf of their members. Who wants to join such a thing? Yeah, <laughs> that's us. <laughs> that's our job, okay? This is the next, next, next uh, piece of legal argument. The Attorney General intervened to conduct only a few prosecutions in very serious and notorious cases. He also had a long-standing prerogative power to halt any prosecution in a court of record by entering, entering a nolly prosecutor, which in modern times he makes rare use of, indeed usually only when he considers the defendant is unfit to plead. Well, you can't really argue with that, can you? Uh, 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 if it's well-founded, if it's honestly done. In 1829 came the first step towards putting the police on the statutory 
will be only regional footing. It was the Metropolitan Police Act of that year. And it established the London Metropolitan Police. It was founded in 1856 by the County and Borough Police Act, which required every county and borough to have its own constabulary. This improvement in the organisation of the police seems to be in the spur to their assumption of responsibility for most prosecutions. Technically, however, the prosecuting police officer was just another private prosecutor. Just another private prosecutor. Okay? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> I thought it was official. Um, okay. <laughs> There we, there we go. Now, what, what that means, of course, is, is, is if the other side try and take interfer, inter, infringe the rights of private prosecutors, then the police will have a problem, won't they? Yeah. The police have a problem. Now, let's say you've got a, a Savile-type situation where the police can't be trusted. Okay? And let's say it's a social worker in charge of a care home that's allegedly interfered with a child. The care home... They work, they're, they're employed by the Crown, effectively. It's a local authority share care home. They're employed by the Crown, aren't you? And the police are the Crown, aren't they? And the court's the Crown. Is it fair for the Crown to investigate the Crown, investigating the Crown? Clearly not, is it? OK, yeah. So it's going to be very hard to justify uh, police forces um, uh, continuing to uh, investigate cases in those circumstances. Now, um, this is where the, the recent um, uh, uh, police commissioners come in. Now, if you look at the fine print, the legislation that they set them up, um, uh, it's, it's, good, it's good in parts. And one of the parts says... It'll be the duty of the, uh, the new, um, the new uh, police commissioner uh, to tender for police services from alternative sources. To tender for police services from alternative sources. So let's say you've got a, 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 a child molesting case or a firearms case, for example. Somebody's accused for having a firearm without a certificate. A chief counsel was responsible for issuing certificates and he, he should have issued a certificate and he hadn't because they have a policy of not recognising self-defence as a good reason for issuing a certificate then there's a problem, isn't there? So that the Crown is investigating bad deeds by the Crown. So that's, that should certainly go, go to an outside body. Okay? Now, the, <coughs> the Prosecution Offences Act does, does recognise private prosecutors having, having, uh, being entitled, entitled to do it, and entitled to do it on a commercial basis. So I've got to tell you, a commercial company has been set up to do that, and they recruit people who are already qualified in, in, in the prosecution process, like retired policemen, as it happens, and barristers and solicitors, um, and they're setting up an alternative prosecution pro prosecution system. Uh, uh, Mike's well aware of it. Um, uh, uh, I've been recruited um, and uh, we, we see that as the way forward. And the thing that keeps us, keeps us honest is, is that if we don't disclose that we're Freemasons or any such nonsense, uh, uh, then we're in breach of our contract and, uh, and we can be held to account for it. Whereas that's a bit more difficult to do with a policeman, isn't it? There we go. The Guria case. John Guria, retired, retired army major, good egg, um, a member of the Magna Carta Society. Um, in 1978, he's a bit concerned about uh, the post office union blocking mail to South Africa because he had friends in South Africa and his mail wasn't getting through. Guria case. This is, this is a quotation from the Gersha case, some of the legal argument. The historical right which goes back to the earliest days of our legal system, though rarely exercised in relation to indictable offences and though ultimately largely controlled by the Attorney General by taking over the prosecution and if he th thinks fit entering a non prosecutor remains a valuable constitutional safeguard against inertia or partiality on the part of authority. So I'll just take you, take you through the first sentence. Historical right, yes, common law. Earliest days of our legal system, the older it is, the stronger it is. Rarely exercised in relation to indictable offences. That's because people didn't know about it, isn't it? The police, for, police were invented and everybody thought it's the police, police force's job. We know better now. The important thing about indictable offences, indictable offences are offences that get you a jury trial get you a jury trial. Now, certain people in this room have had problems with magistrates. Roger, haven't they? I, I must say he's looking well. Prison food obviously does him good. <laughs> um, uh, they've had problems with magistrates. If he'd had a jury trial, do you think the outcome would have been different? Yeah, that's right. So what we're looking at is private prosecution for indictable cases because a jury can decide two things. Did he do it? And would it be just to convict him? So let's say Parliament's passed an unjust act of Parliament. All left-handed people go to prison. I'm clearly left-handed. I will ask for jury trial, okay? And I can say to the jury, well, I'm left-handed, but is this, a, is this a good law or not? What happens currently is that you, a, a Crown Court, the jury, the jury are briefed by the judge, and the judge invariably says, I will tell you what the law is. But he won't say, but you can ignore it if you think it's just. Okay? And, and it's outrageous. Um, anyone meets the old Bailey? Yeah, I, I was a good guy. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the old bailey is built next to the site of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, old, the old prison, whose name escapes me. Um, 
Newgate Prison, yes, yeah. So the left-hand eye is, is a bit of a, a 60s, eye, 60s monstrosity, the, the modern, uh, 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 modern old bay, it's got to be said. But the left-hand side joins onto the, the, old, the old part, and there's a stairwell, and there's a plaque on the stairwell, and it commemorates uh, uh, a case that happened in the early 1600s. Okay, and what, what happened is, uh, the early 1600s, the early Stuart kings, James I, wanted to, wanted to turn the Catholic, country Catholic, um, and um, uh, Puritans resisted. And they were, they're having meetings and making speeches uh, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their meeting houses. So a proclamation was issued by the king, no parliament involved, just a proclamation. Um, and it was nailed to the door of the Quaker meeting house in Drake, Grace Church Street. Uh, and um, uh, it forbade, uh, forbade them to have church services. So, so the Puritans come along one Sunday morning and they say, well, blow it, we'll do it in the street. So they have their service. Um, and uh, William Penn, who subsequently emigrated to, to, um, to uh, uh, America and founded the, uh, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, <coughs> is duly due arrested. And, and it's a show trial, and the Lord Chief Justice is sitting. It's in the Old Bailey, the old Old Bailey. Um, and uh, <coughs> uh, being a good Christian, he, he can't tell a lie. Yes, I did have a, uh, I did have a, uh, a service, but of course, is that a, he's speaking to the jury. I did, I did have a service, but would it be right to commit me? Okay, uh, and uh, <coughs> the jury go out for 20 minutes, and they come back not guilty. Now, whereupon, because it's a show trial, the Lord Chief Justice throws, into, throws, throws a tizzy um, and says, go back and think again. So they come back two hours later. It's the end of the day, two hours later. Not guilty. So he locked them up, and it's described three days without, without food, drink, or tobacco. <laughs> okay? um, and there's a bit of a tumult in the streets outside because the Puritans uh, had a lot of support. Um, and a writ of habeas corpus was obtained, and they were released because of unlawful detention. And eventually, eventually they, were, uh, they, they were released. Um, and uh, there's a plaque commemorating that case, and it's on the, on the stairwell. And because I'm on stage, I can't remember the name of the case, but it'll, it'll come to me shortly. Okay? So, so, so that, that's, what, that's the historical right. A jury can decide right or wrong. So what we, want, what we need to do is privately indict people for jury trials, and then the only person the witness has to convince is who? The jury. The jury. Yeah, that's right. Another quote, Lord Diplock observed at page four night, the need for private questions to be undertaken had largely disappeared, but that right to undertake them still existed and was a use to constitutional safeguard against capricious, corrupt or biased failure or refusal of those authorities to prosecute offenders. Can you read the future? Did, can you read, was he reading the papers? Yeah. Can one confidently say that later advent of the CPS has banished all the concerns, particularly the Gurish case, particularly in relation to inertia? To what, so that's where they're coming from. So there are good judges after all, aren't there? And that's essentially private prosecutions, okay? So I'll summarise. We're all private prosecutors if we need be. We can call upon the assistance of people who are professionally trained, such as ex-policemen, who can form private companies and they have the same power solicitors. And they can investigate things. And the only difference between a private prosecution and a police prosecution is, uh, in order to investigate it, a policeman will arrest somebody, sit in the little room, and ask him questions. Okay? Now what happens when a person's arrested? What does the policeman say to them? You're not obliged to say anything, okay? Yeah, so, so you can't force them. You're not allowed to torture them. You've, you, you've seen lots of TV programmes, and it's up to including torture, isn't it, getting people to confess? No, can't do it, okay? So, so, so what the alternative for the private prosecution is known as the interrogatory. Uh, it's, it's a letter. So you set out the formal allegation. Is it right on day, date, time, and place you did this bad thing? And they have an opportunity to respond, okay? And if they can't respond, uh, then, then the hearing goes ahead, and the only people that have to be convinced is the jury. So now you know about private prosecutions. There we go. Thank you. Thank you.